My name is Charles Weber. I'll be speaking about the basics of the glaucoma evaluation and the care of the glaucoma patient. In this lecture, we'll go over the glaucoma exam, and important points in that exam are measurement of intraocular pressure, gonioscopy, and a detailed evaluation of the optic nerve head. We'll go over quantified characterization of the optic nerve and the various imaging devices and the reporting styles of those devices. And then we'll also finish up with going over visual field testing and the common ways to do that. First component of any patient visit is going to be the history asked of that patient. Uh, that would inc include current complaint from the patient, symptoms, onset, duration, severity, and location, past ocular medical and surgical history, medications and allergies, review of systems, um, assessing their full general health and not just related to their ocular health, as well as their social history, which includes tobacco, alcohol, and other drug use, as well as their occupation and hobbies, and then any family history of both general medical issues as well as ocular health issues. The general exam, in addition to basic components like assessing visual acuity, will include refraction, and that's necessary to perform accurate perimetry to assess the patient's field of vision, which we'll get to later. It's also necessary to gauge ocular morphology. For example, with a patient that is far-sighted or hyperopic, they'll have uh, potentially an association or higher risk of developing ingle closure uh, glaucoma, and they may have a smaller disc. This might be the opposite in a patient that's myopic with a larger optic disc and uh, more open or more likely to have open angles. The exam also includes uh, assessment of the external adnexa, the patient's pupils with careful attention for any afferent pupillary defect, confrontation visual fields, ocular motility, and slit lamp by microscopy. Under the slit lamp, paying close attention to the conjunctiva, things that would be perhaps more likely to be seen in a glaucoma patient or at least salient points to, to be observed any evidence of conjunctival hyperemia, episcleral venous dilation, hypersensitivity reactions, uh, and characteristic changes associated with ocular allergy, including to topical medications, the presence of any previous surgery, including a filtering bleb, and when present, uh, assessing its morphology, assessment of the episclera and sclera, uh, looking at uh, in particular or looking for sentinel vessels that might suggest an intraocular tumor, thinning of the sclera or an area of staphyloma, corneal exam uh, looking for enlargement of the cornea, endothelial abnormalities such as Krukenberg spindle, keratic precipitates, gutte, beaten bronze appearance of the, the endothelium, an anteriorly displaced Schwabe's line, Central corneal thickness and pachymetry is an also important thing to look at, and we'll also discuss its measurement in the future slides. Examination of the anterior chamber uh, includes an estimation of angle width, comparison between the two eyes, presence of any inflammatory cells, red blood cells, and any other material within the, the anterior chamber. Continuing with the slit lamp exam, it includes examination of the iris, looking at heterochromia, areas of atrophy, either generally or sectorally, translumination defects of the iris tissue, both peripherally and, and more centrally, ectropia nuvia, corectopia, iris nevi, nodules, exfoliative material, new vascularization, or any evidence of prior trauma, for example, a sphincter tear. Examination of the lens includes special attention to any lens movement, presence of pseudo-exfoliation to the lens capsule, or subluxation or areas of zonular injury or loss. And then a dilated assessment of the fundus, including assessment of the optic disc, which we'll discuss in greater detail, any evidence of posterior segment pathology, including retinal hemorrhages, vitreous hemorrhages, uh, 
choroidal effusions, masses, inflammatory lesions, retinovascular occlusions, diabetic retinopathy, and retinal detachment. Intraocular pressure measurement, uh, regardless of the device used, it's important to ensure that that device is in good working order and that it's properly calibrated. There's a number of different ways to measure intraocular pressure and a number of different devices. The most commonly uh, used device in the United States uh, in an ophthalmologist's office would be the Goldman intraocular pressure uh, tonometer, and that's depicted here. You'll see on the left-hand side of the screen uh, what the mire should properly look like, uh, not too thin, not too thick, and uh, aligned. The alignment is discussed uh, or depicted on the right-hand image uh, in the leftmost of those uh, diagrams shows high intraocular pressure, or in other words, the tonometer uh, being uh, too low and needing to be uh, adjusted such that a higher IOP is dialed in. Uh, the middle diagram shows uh, too low on the intraocular pressure gauge and on the far right is just right. So just the proper amount of uh, overlap with the inner edges of the rings just touching one another giving the correct intraocular pressure measurement. Central corneal thickness and corneal pachymetry is also important in assessment of the glaucoma patient. Uh, we know this primarily from the ocular hypertension treatment study, which showed that a thinner cornea conferred a higher risk of glaucoma. Central corneal thickness is thought to be more of a biomarker for structural or physical factors involved in the pathogenesis of primary open angle glaucoma and is more than simply just an adjustment that's made to intraocular pressure. The figure taken from the OATS data depicted on the right-hand side of the screen shows in the far upper left uh, when pressure, um, sorry, when uh, the, the risk is assessed by the height of the columns, uh, we can see that with a thinner central corneal thickness and a higher intraocular pressure uh, there is a higher risk of ultimately developing glaucoma in those patients followed in the OATS study. As we move to the right in the diagram in each of those rows, uh, there is a reduction in overall uh, prevalence of developing glaucoma as we increase in cor central corneal thickness. Gonioscopy is also uh, important in the assessment of the glaucoma patient. Uh, it's an essential diagnostic tool and examination technique. It's required to visualize the anterior chamber angle due to total internal reflection at the tear air interface. And depending on the lens used for visualization, we can either uh, observe it directly or indirectly. Depicted in the image on the right-hand side of the screen is an indirect view of the anterior chamber angle with a mirrored lens uh, on the surface of the cornea. Direct gonioscopy, examples of these lenses are Kepe, Barkan, Wurst, Swan Jacobs, and Richardson. Um, the lens is placed on the surface of the eye and saline solution or some other coupling solution is used to fill the space between the gonioscopy lens and the cornea. It gives an erect view of the angle structures and is really mostly used and essential to angle surgery. On the right hand side of the screen, you'll see a, an example of direct gonioscopy where the gonio lens allows us to overcome the total internal reflection for direct observation of the anterior chamber angle. Indirect gonioscopy is more frequently used in clinical examination. It gives an inverted and slightly foreshortened image of the trabecular meshwork and angle structures. There are two main groups of lenses used in uh, indirect gonioscopy, either flanged or non-flanged. The flanged or Goldman type lens uh, requires a coupling, ag a coupling gel or viscous fluid. It gives the clearest view, but if there's any pressure applied to the cornea, it can give a, a, a distorted anterior chamber angle view and can narrow it artificially. A non-flanged uh, gonio lens such as Posner, Sussman, Zeiss 
they give a smaller area of contact which allows for dynamic or indentation gonioscopy. And it's coupled merely by the patient's tear film and doesn't require any additional coupling agent. Important points with gonioscopy are first, orienting yourself and recognizing the important angle landmarks. Scleral spur and Schwabe's line are the most consistent of the landmarks. And an easy way to identify Schwabe's line is with the corneal light wedge, which is depicted here in the right hand image. Uh, as the two parallel light beams converge, they converge at the peripheral cornea uh, corresponding to Schwabe's line. This serves as a point of orientation for then going on to identify the other angle structures. Um, Posterior to Schwabe's line is the non-pigmented trabecular meshwork, followed by the pigmented trabecular meshwork, the scleral spur, and then final, finally ciliary body and iris root insertion. It's important also to evaluate for any pathology that's present, such as evidence of previ previous trauma with angle recession, areas of irritodialysis, peripheral anterior synechiae, and any other uh, important findings like, such as uh, neovascularization. There are a variety of different gonioscopy grading systems. The two most common are the Schaefer system and the Spathe system. Uh, this slide depicts the Schaefer uh, system, which describes the angle between the trabecular meshwork and the iris. Uh, a grade four angle is a 45 degree insertion of the iris in the uh, angle it forms with the trabecular meshwork. Grade zero is closed angle, and then the different grades in between uh, correspond to varying degrees of iris insertion. Spathe grading provides greater detail and goes on to describe the peripheral iris contour, insertion of the iris root, and effects of dynamic gonioscopy. The spathe grading is uh, typically presented in a way that gives a letter as the first, uh, capital letter as the first item, a number corresponding to the angle of approach of the iris to the angle structures, a lowercase letter that describes the peripheral iris, and then a grade of trabecular meshwork uh, pigmentation. The iris insertion, A stands for anterior to Schwabe's line, B stands for between the Schwabe's line and the scleral spur. Uh, C indicates that the scleral spur is visible. D indicates that the deep ciliary body is visible. And uh, E extant, uh, stands for extremely deep uh, with a greater than expected amount of ciliary body visible. Angular approach uh, comes with experience to grade this degree of angle. Um, and is noted uh, second. Peripheral iris, uh, there can be a few different ways to describe its insertion, regular or flat, indicating uh, essentially normal uh, uh, presence of iris insertion, can be steep or bowed anteriorly, or there may be evidence of plateau iris, and queer or concave indicates a backward bowing. The trabecular meshwork pigmentation, the assessment of this also comes with experience and frequent viewing of the trabecular meshwork. Uh, zero is no pigment uh, going up to grade four, which is very intense or uh, broadly distributed pigmentation. The optic nerve exam can be uh, performed clinically in three different ways, either with a direct ophthalmoscope, an indirect ophthalmoscope, or a slit lamp biomicroscope using a posterior pole lens. The direct ophthalmoscope does not provide sufficient detail to detect subtle, subtle changes over time. Can be useful in screening for glaucomatous optic atrophy, but due to its uh, non-depth uh, of detail, it does not provide uh, an excellent way to provide uh, assessment in time. The indirect ophthalmoscope uh, can be used to observe cupping and pallor, um, but they're less pronounced in that method, and the magnification is inadequate, so it's not generally recommended for assessment of the glaucoma patient and the optic nerve head in particular. And slit lamp biomicroscope 
using a posterior pole lens is the best method for examination for the diagnosis of glaucoma. It gives a binocular view and excellent detail and magnification. The cup to disc ratio alone uh, when noting the optic nerve appearance is not adequate. Um, early changes that can indicate glaucomatous optic neuropathy would include generalized enlargement of the cup, focal enlargement of the cup, vertical elongation of the cup, presence of a disc hemorrhage, an area of nerve fiber layer loss, asymmetry of cupping, and beta zone peripapillary atrophy, and we'll show some examples of each of those. A general rule is the isn't rule in assessment of the optic nerve, which is meant to indicate that the inferior rim is uh, typically the thickest, followed by the superior rim, followed by the nasal rim, and the thinnest portion of the neurofiber uh, rim is the temporal rim. This is a, an excellent example of a normal disc. We see a robust uh, retinal nerve fiber layer. The isn't rule is followed. Uh, there's no peripapillary atrophy and there's no disc hemorrhage. This is a large normal disc uh, which does have an increased cup to disc ratio but is otherwise healthy. There's a robust nerve fiber layer. It follows the isn't rule. There's no peripapillary atrophy and there's no disc hemorrhage. This shows a disc hemorrhage with a corresponding RNFL wedge defect in area of focal thinning. We can see an inferior temporal notch to the neurofiber rim. There's a corresponding wedge defect uh, and loss of nerve fiber layer in the same area as the disc hemorrhage. Here we see an example of beta zone peripapillary atrophy with notching and there is also alpha zone peripapillary atrophy present as well which is essentially normal. The alpha zone is the temporal zone depicted here. The beta zone is uh, area of peripapillary atrophy is inferior to the nerve here where there's an arrow de depicting the area of notch. There are a few different ways in which we can quantitatively measure the RNFL and there's a few different imaging devices to do that. One of which is the confocal scanning laser tomograph. The other is scanning laser polymetry and a third and more most common, commonly used type in the United States is optical coherence tomography. We'll take a look at each of those. Confocal scanning laser tomography, uh, the most widely available platform for this is the Heidelberg retinal tomograph. There are serial images that are acquired in uh, planar views and those are stacked upon one another after being aligned to give a 3D morphology of the disc and that's what these images are depicting. Any images of unacceptable quality are automatically eliminated by the device. The output looks like this. At the uh, very top of the, the output um, in the area with the capital A next to it uh, gives the quality parameters as well as the patient's identification information. The Next section below that shows the uh, image of the disc and nerve fiber layer. C shows more fields uh, per, uh, analysis of the disc morphology and alerts the examiner to areas of possible difference from the normative database and its own internal regression analysis within the, the software. The RNFL contour is depicted at the bottom portion of the output uh, showing uh, any areas of concern as well. Scanning laser polymetry uh, or uh, GDX takes advantage of the fact that there is a difference in the way in which uh, polarized light is reflected 
by the nerve fiber layer uh, due to its birefringence and can detect, detect areas of nerve fiber layer damage as a result. The GDX output uh, looks somewhat similar to the Heidelberg uh, as well as the OCT output. Uh, again, showing identification information at the top of the, the output. There is a section showing uh, essentially an onfos or fundus image of the, the disc uh, at the top portion. Centrally, it shows uh, summary, uh, summary parameters of the RNFL uh, showing areas of the birefringence and detection of possible areas of thinning. And then uh, this is used to produce an outline of the RNFL as well as, well as highlight areas that are uh, substantially different from the normative database. The most widely used imaging technology in the United States for a quantitative assessment of the optic nerve and retinal nerve fiber layer is optical coherence tomography. And there's two main groups of this technology. Time domain is the older device, uh, which uh, takes longer to acquire its scans and has less detail. Spectral domain uses uh, a spectral interferogram and Fourier transform to essentially acquire more imaging in less time uh, and in greater detail. And so it gives us a bit more information about the health of the retinal nerve fiber layer and uh, greater ability to assess change in time. So again, time domain OCT slow and relatively inefficient. Spectral domain OCT fast and higher resolution. The imaging of the optic nerve head in RNFL, the output looks similar to this, where we see both a vertical and transverse slice through the optic nerve head, as well as a, a created on FOSS image and highlighted areas of possible change from the normative database. This identification information has been eliminated from the top portion of this output, as well as the quality parameters have been cut off by this particular uh, example. At the top portion shows various characteristics of the patient's optic disc, uh, its size, rim area, and the average RNFL thickness to give a general overview. Uh, detailed uh, sections are uh, depicted in the bottom portion of the output with uh, green representing average or normal thickness of the RNFL in areas of yellow or red uh, falling outside of what's considered the normal range. For each of these devices, uh, when the imaging report is evaluated, it's important to look at the proper patient uh, is identified that you're looking at the, the output that corresponds to that particular patient, that the correct age and date of birth has been placed into the imaging device for proper uh, comparison to the normative database, that the scan has sufficient signal strength uh, to give sufficient quality, that it's well centered uh, and aligned. If these are not met, the output data uh, may be insufficient to make uh, quality, a qualitative assessment of the patient's optic nerve and, and RNFL. Moving on to the visual field. So the overall goal of glaucoma management is preservation of the patient's functional vision and quality of life. And the most important assessment of that is the visual field. This diagram depicts the hill of vision with uh, greater uh, detail of uh, vision occurring at the fovea, uh, which is the point of fixation at the top of the hill, and then uh, decreasing detail as we move out in the field of vision. And we're trying to do our best to maintain the entirety of this field of vision for each of our patients. The main purposes of Perimetry are to identify anyone with an abnormal visual field and then to also provide a quantitative assessment of that patient's visual field, whether normal or abnormal, and following that over time. There are two major types, automated static perimetry. This would be frequency doubling technology, the Humphrey visual field, for example, 
and then manual kinetic and static perimetry using a Goldman type bull perimeter. I'll discuss mostly the Humphrey visual field testing, which is the most widely used type in the United States. Uh, there are multiple different testing algorithms available on this device. The different algorithms um, provide pros and cons to each of them. In general, the 30-2 is considered too time consuming to do on a, a regular basis for patients. Uh, it suffers from patient fatigue and may have more variability as a result. The 24-2 algorithm is my preferred approach. Uh, there are two types that are possible to uh, use for that, CETA FAST and the CETA standard. The FAST is adequate for screening, but it doesn't tend to do as well in detecting areas of change or mild loss. Uh, FAST can be useful in glaucoma suspects when you're generally searching for an area of scotoma in a glaucoma patient or someone suspicious for glaucoma or in someone that just simply cannot sit for a full standard test. The standard is truly best when uh, used in a confirmed glaucoma patient in de detecting progression over time as it provides greater detail. The FASTPAK size 5 is available for patients with low visual acuity, providing a larger stimulus, uh, but still allows us to detect the, any scotomas due to glaucoma. The 10-2 algorithm is useful in advanced glaucoma uh, when the peripheral vision is sufficiently changed that a 24-2 or wider field may be uh, of insufficient detail of the remaining vision. And it's also useful for macular pathologies. The interpretation of the visual field is, uh, it is important, similar to the imaging devices, to confirm that the proper uh, patient is being examined, that their age has been input appropriately, and that you're looking at the proper date of test. Uh, check the testing algorithm. Make sure that you're comparing apples to apples, that a, if the patient had a 24-2 CETA standard in the past, that that's what you're comparing to um, that particular exam day. Confirm that there's an appropriately sized target for the patient's visual acuity. Uh, review the pupil, pupil diameter and refraction, both of which can affect the quality of the test. Uh, look at the reliability parameters, including the fixation losses, false positives, and false negatives and then move on finally to looking at the actual output from the visual field test and evaluate the numerical values of each of the different tests, looking mostly at the pattern deviation for glaucomatous field loss. In the assessment of progression, uh, it's important to separate real change from ordinary vari variation. There's some variability in a particular patient from test day to test day, and not every visual field is going to look identical in time, even if their glaucoma has been stable. Um, determine the likelihood that change has taken place and that that, that that change is related to glaucoma. Run progression algorithms when you're able to. So if a patient has at least two baseline visual fields in the Humphrey visual field test, Subsequent tests can then be used to run the progression algorithms and allow the computer's automated software to make an assessment of progression. Correlate the exam with optic nerve imaging and uh, with the patient's optic nerve head examination. It should fit if there's progression on visual field that there is also progression on their optic nerve head analysis as well as on your examination of the patient. So in conclusion, really overall is the attention to de detail is paramount. The clinical examination will allow for the most accurate diagnosis of the glaucoma and the glaucoma subtype, and then that will further allow you to risk stratify that patient for possibility of future progression or change in time. Testing characterizes the degree of change that's taken place for that particular patient, and then subsequent testing allows for uh, detection of advancing glaucomatous change and visual field loss 
which is of course important to maintaining that patient's functional vision and quality of life.